Welcome to Retrained Search, the podcast, where we lift the lid on what it's really like to work retained, discuss the stories we've gathered along the way, and give you all a peek behind the scenes of our amazing community and how they're getting ahead. Okay. Got it. Done. Got it. We're in. Hi, everybody. Welcome to, I don't even know what episode we're on now, Lou. No idea. Yeah. No, no clue. Um, Sorry. Seven, eight? I don't know. Could be. I don't know. Welcome back to the Retrain Search podcast. Um, hi, Lou. Hi. We are delighted, both of us, to be joined by the wonderful David Wollstoneholm today from Brand Me Better, um, who is very kindly joining us all the way from Sydney, Australia. It's 10pm and I have confirmed he is allowed to continue drinking beer. Yeah, Good. I've approved also. Secondary approval granted. Mm. Thank you. I've earned it. You have? You had a busy day? I don't like the word busy, but yeah, it's been busy. That's it. How's baby? Amazing. Oh. I've got a 15-year-old smelly boy. I've got a six-year-old who's uh, close to be diagnosed with ADHD. They're intense. They kind of love me, but I've got this almost two-year-old daughter that just thinks I am like, I'm like God. I'm like Eric Cantona to her. Oh. <laughs> so life's oh. pretty wonderful. Like her, egotistical, right? arrogant. <laughs> That's Eric Cantona, isn't it? Yeah, so I talk to her about seagulls and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what he talks about? He's mental. He's Is amazing, it? but mental. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like a creative type, isn't it? Mm. Mm. How are you, George? Talk to about, talk, before we get into chit chat, talk about your hair, Lou. Oh, yeah. I was going to do a LinkedIn post on it, actually, um, because we're going to be talking about that. So I might as well share that with you. I was going to do a curly or straight LinkedIn post, and the team went, hmm, not sure about that. So I haven't done it. Um, what do you think, curly or straight? I'm liking curly. Yeah, that's what Jordan said. Yeah, I like yeah. it. it. Looks cool. Yeah. Peach wavy. Nice. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Went to yeah. a curly specialist, a curly hair specialist. Apparently, they have those things. Things. seven of them in the world. <laughs> and there's one in Shrewsbury, and they are sending nowhere near where I live. How cool is that? Who would have thought? Who would have who, thought? Who'd have thought? Yeah. What are the and, uh, it's just I'm blessed. That's that's yeah. um, a good thing that's happened. We've had some tough, tough. Had some tough stuff happen recently. Had to um, overcome some challenges. You know, with your hair. No, with like people. Oh, sorry. Some people not not. I've had some people not being very pleasant recently. No, that's not something you should talk about. But I've had to yeah. sort of be quite. No, we don't need. And in fact, weirdly, on the um, collab call that I've just done in our mastermind. We've got a guy, Carson, who's just recently joined us, who is working with a client that he doesn't want to work with anymore. And his, his question was, here's the situation. How do I say it's over? And weirdly, we've kind of had to do that with, yeah, with uh, a couple of people recently because they've just not been very pleasant. And sometimes what I've learned and I'm getting better at is the time that you free up from working with people that are difficult, unpleasant, unkind and not you know not not doing positive things for you or your team or your business um you great things happen when you free that space up you don't have to be tied down to that do you so that's go to Mallorca a little chit chat what go to Mallorca is that what you just said I think the other thing with it is go to Mallorca with the time yeah (laughs) I think the other thing when you, you go through that kind of process and you break up with somebody you're quite diagnostic about that relationship, but then you start to look at those early warning signs where they were yes. there that you might not recognise. I think it, it keeps helps you in good stead for the future when you get those kind of alarm bells ringing. Yeah, um, and with yeah, I was talking about this to um, well, I was going to say my coach Rebecca, but also now Jordan's coach Rebecca Shannon, who I'll give a quick shout out to because she's fucking awesome, and she was explaining that when you're you know in growth mode which we all are but earlier on in the journey when you come across people like that and behaviors like that 
you internalize it and think what what is it that I'm doing and what should I be doing differently and how can I please this person and it's the same when you're working with a new client who's being awkward and difficult you're thinking oh it's me and how can I and then when you get better and more confident in yourself and or your process in your business or whatever it is whether it's personal or business you get to the stage where you can realize it isn't you it is a red flag and it, it, it it's something that you can pick on uh, pick up on early and that's what I'm getting better at doing and I just advise people not to ignore those red flags maybe the narrative as well of you know the customer's always right as added f- fire to that f- added few yeah. fire as well you know the customer's always right well they're not always are they no they're not mm. do you know what it's interesting an old boss of mine um used to talk a lot about aspirational clients and who did we want to work with and I took this from him, but he used to say, the way I define that is if I'm sitting at home on a Friday night at 8 p.m. and a client calls me and says, Jordan, you're not going to believe it. I'm in Warrington. Do you fancy grabbing a beer? If my first thought is, no, not really. Yeah. But you don't want to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Give the boss a plug. What's their name? Yeah, a guy called Doug McKay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true, right? Yeah, it so, is. I agree. It's nice when you're working with people that you would go for a beer with. It's nice. It's fun. It's like this, isn't it? Yeah. yeah easy. Yeah. Easy, easy. But I've got the beer. So, um, yeah. Dave, what have you been up to work-wise? What kind of work? Well, um, I've had a little bit of American interest because I went on a certain collab call with... Uh, <laughs> Some wonderful people by the name of Louise and Jordan, and so that's meant uh, more interest in my services, um, more early morning calls, and there's gonna be a couple of people have signed up, so there's gonna be more late night calls maybe as well. Oh, but, nice, uh, good. I, I, I like. I mean, I you know I am a one person company. I do have a couple of contracts to help me out with a few different things, but um, you know I like being global. It's it's a great feeling, and I think. Mm. You know, some markets might dip, some pick up, but the opportunity to have a global client base or international client base is something I don't take lightly. It's brilliant. And so, yeah, thanks for thanks for letting me go on your show, your, your mm-hmm. co-op show. Pleasure. Pleasure. We love it. We love having you around. And um, what when you say you know you're working with these people, what will the typical journey be on? the way that you go on with them? It depends. I mean, it depends what they want to do to engage with services. It could be, I mean, I tend to have three options where I work with people, and that's um, like a package of a handful of coaching calls. Mm. Um, It could be a really strategic personal branding program called Build, or it could be a a similar version to the Build, but whereby they want me to help them with their content because they haven't got the time, the resources, the skill set, and they want me to provide that support for them. And I love, 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 we both do. Love, love, love what you do. And we work with you um, because of that. And you're an all-round great guy as well. But not many people do work in the way that you do. And that journey that you go on with them, that build program, will you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, of course I will. Um, well, the first thing is <clears throat> brand, whether you call it personal brand or company brand, is strategic, it's a strategy. Marketing is more of a tactical-based thing. And so brand, to understand a personal brand or a company brand, you've got to go through a process of discovery. And that process is by uncovering who you are, as in your authentic self, then it's looking at things like your brand substance, your purpose, your vision, your values. And then it's like how you position your brand in the marketplace, what your proposition is as well. You know, how how do you communicate that to the world online and offline as well? And I become a student of of behavior of, you know, personal brands become a little bit too obsessive. And the reality is, is that if you're an experienced consultant or leader, then it's what your customer or employees say or feel about you. And so part of my process is to actually talk to those customers and get the insights for them and then build a strategic plan around that that's going to improve your personal brand, 
provide them with the marketing and content that you want to create and also drive your value proposition in the marketplace as well. It's not for everyone because I think it's all all about that kind of get quick fix now and you know jump onto LinkedIn and do marketing tactics. But if you go through a process of doing something like this, then your brand is everything. It's all consuming. It's what you do online and offline, how you think, how you believe, what your beliefs are, what promise you bring to the world. And so it just flows into that marketing consistency as well. Mm. So it's not for everyone, and a lot of people don't want that. Mm. Um, but it's a process I go through to understand their internal brand and proposition, and then understand the customers that they're trying to attract, and then finding a middle ground of well, how are we going to do this online and on, offline to to build this community of uh, ideal clients or candidates that you want to attract. Who, who is it for, Dave? Like you said, it's not for everyone. If you were to kind of look at your your perfect customer right someone that's sitting there that's got a great opportunity in building a personal brand what does that person look like that's a really good question um firstly they're the kind of person that really believe in development they always want to keep getting better they tend to be the kind of people that would do the retrain course um, mm -hmm. dare i say um they also recognize their skill shortages and they earn enough money and they're successful enough to go, there's things there that I need to outsource and rely on, depending on what kind of service he engaged me for. But the reality is they've realized as well, they have a brand and they want to know how to kind of package that up, position that, and how they want to, you know, communicate that to the world as well. And they lack confidence. Mm. And I've said this a million times to it. Lots of people, you know, I work with CEOs of $300 million businesses. I work with startups as well. They all have this little bit of imposter syndrome about going on this journey with me because, um, you know, I, I get them to look really inwards of themselves, but also then defining their proposition and message to the market. And then these people are successful people, but they, you know, they feel intimidated because when, when they put their world out on social media, there's going to be people that think they're amazing. Some people think they're a twat. And some people that just don't think anything about them. And so that is hard for a lot of people. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting you, you talk about the um, imposter syndrome piece because I see that in a lot of our members. Mm. The most successful people are the ones that are willing to be vulnerable and to share their weaknesses and to share where they're scared. Scared. Sorry, Lou, not scared. Scared. Um, <laughs> He's going oh, for a haircut, like, after. Going for a, going for a haircut in a bit, yeah, sorry. I'm working on it. I'm trying to improve. No, um, I love it. But that's, that's a theme, isn't it? The, you know, well, just to add to that as well, which is really important, you know, a lot of my clients, they they want to know um, what customers really think about them, the ones that engage me to go on the build program or they want me to interview their customers. Because, yes, they want to know about their proposition. They want to know about what content they want need to create but they want to know what are the things that they're not doing so well that mr or mrs client might open up and tell me more things than they might get from themselves yeah and that is scary isn't yeah of course it, it is it's course really it is. fucking scary i mean for, for, for me and for us and jordan i know went through the same process but even just getting to the heart of like who you are like how can you how can you live and breathe a brand when you haven't connected it with who you actually are like it makes so much sense that it seems so hollow having been through that process thinking even thinking about just putting stuff randomly out on LinkedIn you know and embarking on marketing and branding without doing that it doesn't make any sense like if it's not connected to you and your values and your beliefs and who you really are how can you really live and breathe that and it doesn't it doesn't mean anything does it and it's it's very well I suppose the word I would use is yeah a bit scary quite invasive almost like because you really dig very deep and you can get a bit like oh really um well and, i think the thing is as well is sorry is uh you know i we have company values and core values but i understand i go through people's journey of personal values and you know yeah. studying other human behavior experts which i'm not um i found a methodology that really interprets that if you look at the biggest voids and challenges in your life they will determine the things that you value most in your life and they can change 
but the bigger the void in the choice, the typically the big, the more important that value is to you as well. So it's about knowing what they are and communicating them to the world as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is really, you know, it's our most vulnerable selves, isn't it? The biggest challenges that we face. Um, but the best place to get to what our real values are. And it's amazing. It's incredible what you do. The piece that um, is also, I absolutely adore about what you do is the talking to the customers that you mentioned. What, when you're talking to someone's customers, what, what are you like you're because you'll interview a client won't you for of some yeah. days um often like ridiculously senior if that's their target client mm. what kind of things are you wanting to find out from them and what what kind of things do you find out well what problem they solve you know how they do things differently you know how would they describe their personality what they're known for um what do they want for them that they're not getting uh, how would they describe their their service or solution to another senior peer? You know, there's some generic questions I ask in there as well, which didn't necessarily think that we're going to be in there. But most great recruiters around the world do not ask for referrals, and they don't ask for referrals in a way that's um, compelling to the um, to the client or memorable. So they will do that. So I even asked that question on many of my interviews, you know, did they ask for referrals? Uh, and most of the time they say, no, I can't, I can't recall that. And then I'll put them on the spot and say, well, can you actually tell me two or three people in your network who you think might be a really good fit? And they just sometimes go, that's weird. You should say that there's John Smith and such and such a company. He'd be a great person for Ralph. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll message him today. And I'm like, <clears throat> You know, this is stuff they could be doing themselves. It's yeah, basic yeah. questions, but they just don't ask it. And I'm talking about really, really, really successful recruiters as well. Yeah, you shared some of this on, on the collab call the other week, Dave, about speaking to customers and understanding, you know, what do they want to hear about? And I was speaking to a member of ours a couple of days later and I was sharing what you shared. And I said, do you know what, Dragon's Den in the UK, for any of you that know it, right, where people go on and pitch these business ideas, these entrepreneurs. Shark Tank in Australia, but yeah. Shark Tank, yeah, yeah. What's Every... it called Shark Tank? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. more sharks in Australia, right? We don't have dragons in the UK, though. Anyway, I don't get it. But <laughs> right, every now and again, someone comes in and pitches a business and you go, shit, I can't believe no one's ever thought of that before. Yeah, that, it's so simple. It's so obvious. Oh, that's staring you in the face. Some of that, that's just exactly the same, right? Like, of yeah. course. Like, yeah, yeah. why wouldn't you just go and say it to customers? Yeah. What do you hear about when? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And... I know. Like, yeah, it, was, yeah, and yeah. it came up because we were talking about what, what you know, what's your advice? You're about to make some content. You're about to put some content out on LinkedIn. Dave, go. And Dave's answer is. Just ask your customers what they want to hear. What do they want to say? The it's the fucking well, simplest thing. It's the simplest it's, thing, it's, it's, and nobody does it. Well, they they, you know, they literally tell me what your value. If you talk to enough customers, and they, you know, you've delivered them enough value to them, they will tell me that the benefits of your service and what your value proposition is, and then you just feed that through your content. Yeah. You know, the LinkedIn bio will feed out what those customers say about you. Um, when you go into meetings, you'll be talking about these differentiators because it's what your key customers say about you. Yeah. You don't need me. I mean, I can help because I can develop the messaging and the position. And they will tell me things that they might not feel so open to telling you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just so simple. Yeah. 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 And again, the reason why I've kind of, done this is because if you look at great brands they don't just jump onto linkedin you know great product brands and company brands they do a whole lot of research they talk to consumers they look they do competitor analysis mm -hmm. um you know they look at positioning in the marketplace they bring that brand to life they get so obsessive with their ideal customer then they start to do the marketing <laughs> you know that's why it works when I was um, younger, we used to make some extra pounds from um, going and doing market research sessions. Have you ever done them? Where you have to go and sit and talk about toothpaste for like two hours or, or um, uh, yeah, or, or anything or crisps or I've done so many. And 
that's what they do. Like, what do you like about a product? What don't you like? Well, the bags are like a quarter full for a fucking start. Um, <laughs> or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and 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 they get it, like they get it from their customers and they ask, like, where do you where do you want to see us? Do you want to see adverts for us on the TV? Do you mind that it's in a magazine? Where did you last see an advert of ours? What do you what do you want our branding to look like? Like, here's what we're thinking of rebranding. Like they ask their customers all the time. Absolutely. Like, why, why, don't, why don't recruiters do that as a regular like automatic? Because they, they've they've never thought about brand strategy. That's that's no. the, the the B end of all of it all as well. It's always tactical based marketing, not brand strategy. And I think the the reality of all this is that um, people are getting it. I mean, what's stopping you from invest? I mean, it costs money. That's one of the problems. You yeah. Know, what's stopping you yeah. from actually getting a focus group together um, as a recruitment agency and getting your best clients in together and get them all talking in a group? Yeah. You know, you yeah. What do they want from recruiters? What do they want? If you could design your ideal recruitment, you know, partner, what would it look like? You know, I I might even ask questions about what services they might want. Mm. what they're not getting mm. yeah yeah you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous ridiculously <laughs> I, i'll ask them about their challenges and opportunities outside of recruitment they just come to me with all these you know it's strategic planning it's um debt reduction or whatever that is in their field and i just just listen and write all this down and type notes and then i become like a content machine for my yeah. clients because i know all the things that their clients want, what's keeping them up at night, what happens if they don't solve it, it's borders on ridiculous, but they yeah. give me all that information. You're a bloody genius. That's why we love you so much. No, well, no, 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 no. I know, but sometimes the most the most incredible things are the simplest, aren't they? You know? Yeah, maybe. I love it. Well, well, it's difficult as well, right, while your head's in it. Where you've got all you've got all these plates spinning and everything yeah. going on, it's difficult. Sometimes it takes someone with your skill set, Dave, that's outside of it to say, "I've got this." Yeah, yeah. But then you, you think about that if you then start to do tactical advertising and and content and promotions and events, you've done all that research. How much more likely is it going to succeed when you develop your marketing yeah. plans and you, yeah. you go to market? It just well, it's like, why would you go and talk about stuff on LinkedIn or on emails or anywhere for that matter when you don't know what your customers want to hear? It just seems fucking stupid. Why wouldn't yeah, you absolutely. ask them, what do you want to hear from us? What do you want? What can we give you that you'd be interested in reading or watching or seeing? Yeah. yeah. And the other thing as well is, you know, when you do read it, positioning is about trying to find a gap in the hearts and minds of your target audience. And, you know, most great brands do this and businesses do this. But, you know, your positioning statement is really your target audience, the problem they have, the solution that they provide, you provide, what you do different to your competitors, and then that kind of key differentiator. And if you position that, it takes, you know, you have to go through research and do analysis of the competitors and look at your strengths and whatnot. But if you build that statement, that should inform all your marketing. I'll give you an example. You, you, we know we know the wonderful people in Yield in um, in uh, Australia. Okay, so you know one of the things that we identified with with their business was that uh, when they work on projects or search assignments together for executives, they work on it together. Mm-hmm. And when you go to a search firm, you know the, the the partner might win that business, and they might feed it off to the researchers and the lower level people as well. But when they work on something, they work on it together as a team, which is just kind of unique Uh to high-profile people. So the differentiator for them is around diversity of thinking. And we can then sell the benefits of that in their content of what that diversity of thinking comes when you've got two partners working on one search project, which is unusual. It is. It is very nice. But again, that um, came on a journey. That you, we didn't just come out of the sky with that. That takes a lot of planning and research and conversations and analysis as well. And I mean, you talk about it being an investment, which it is. And um, but people get quite 
good results, don't they? Like, I mean, we know firsthand that going on a journey to align your beliefs and your values with your brand and your personal brand, understanding what your customers want to hear in that journey you've just set out and then speaking to that, speaking to that gap in their hearts and minds and, and their problems, like, produces quite incredible, like, astounding, in some cases, results, doesn't it? Like, can you yeah. share some of those with us? Can you... Look at a few people. Things that happen. I think one of the one of the most successful relationships I have with uh, a recruiter is a, a chap. I won't name him. I'll keep him confidential. But uh, phenomenally successful. He builds close to three million dollars a year on his own, wow. and we work together very strategically. He's so invested in our partnership, and he he reckons about fifteen percent of what comes in business wise is through our partnership. You know, you can't put an exact figure on that, but that's a serious amount of money. That's just one person. Mm -hmm. But again, we work as a really close team. We're always looking at online and offline activities, repositioning his brand if it needs repositioning. His customers, we have conversation all the time about content and content pillars as well. Um, but it works phenomenally well, but he's so invested in the process. So that's just one example. Yeah. And I don't like to think oh, that we're an example of that as well. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, right? yeah. Like the we conversations are. that we have with people that we've never met before that tell me, I feel like I know you already, mm -hmm. is testament to them understanding our personal brands and how we feel and how we act and what our values are. And I shared in. We, 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 we've worked on things together that has been around your personal brand, but it's then you've had our harm modes because I've given you input. And you've got, wow, that's great stuff we could put for a company campaign or, yeah. you know, part of our webinar message or whatever yeah. that might be. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, if anyone's listening, personal branding is ridiculously important, but so is company branding and messaging and marketing as well. And so there's got to be some crossover there. Well, in fact, one of our members that has been working with you shared some content that you had worked with them on, as, as in exactly the process that you've just talked about, that was put out through their company brand and went viral and then got turned into another piece of content that ended up generating meetings with very, very, very senior prospects that's converted within weeks to nearly two hundred thousand dollars worth of work. Well, I think the thing is okay. as well. If we look, we look at LinkedIn. I mean, company pages are not necessarily the flavor of the month. They don't get no. a lot of engagement. People don't. No, care. no. That, that doesn't mean, in my eyes, that you don't use that because you still have a connection to people. And so we know mm. that most recruitment firms and search firms, part of my French, are piss poor at this. They don't deliver value and insights and engagement and. and and connect with their audience through that content. So I'm not an advocate of saying that LinkedIn company pages are dead. Yes, maybe they don't get what you're looking for in terms of engagement, but they're still an amazing platform mm -hmm. or channel to be able to disseminate disseminate good content to, to your audience. Thank you. They are. Um, thank you, Dave. Um, I wanted everyone to hear that because... It's been like game changing for us and for everybody else I know that's worked with you. So, like Dave says, whether not, a, you... not everyone, I don't, I don't, I don't succeed with everyone because I think you yeah. you can oversell that. But with you, in the way that in the way that works well with the right people, yeah, I think we yeah, all that's know what, what works well with the right people, and we're all on a journey with that, aren't we? Hence the starting point of our conversation before we get we get better at going no this isn't going to work this is not the right partnership and uh, we have the same same thing i'll give you an example of that you know there's there's one client that i've worked with and i just don't think they really got value with my service whatsoever and then they went to my one of my competitors and um you know they started to brand themselves left right and center now me personally i think their their content is quite poor you know, it's not thought provoking enough, but I think it generates results for it, it works. So sometimes you just got to find that right person that yeah. uh, supplier yeah. that partners well with you. Yes, but you know you can help. 
And talking of helping, what have you been helping people with recently, George? Um, oh, lots of things. One of the big things, actually, um, is just trying to help our members relax when they're talking about retained customers. It's it's funny how I think there's we've talked before, right, Lou, that one of the biggest misconceptions in retained is often that it's only right for C suite and boardroom level hiring. And sometimes people do join us with that misconception. Yeah. And it's amazing how when I'm engaging with them just in conversation, their personality shines through and they're so engaging. And then sometimes the first time they pitch, it's like they turn into some super corporate stiff. Yeah. 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 And I wonder whether Go it's on. linked to that misconception. Yeah. And like yeah. often the first piece of feedback that I give people is, yeah. just chill out. Like, yeah. just calm down, just be yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. good. Yeah, so very good. That over the past week, just helping people understand that people are buying them right and yeah the solution is really important the solving customers problems is really important but th there is real emphasis that needs to be placed on how they deliver the message mm. and being yeah. engaged and, and being the human yeah. and yourself yeah yeah is that yeah. more nerves or is it more that they just put so much pressure on themselves that they want to do it well that they get both i think uh, I'd agree. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, and it and it does come. But you see people relax more and more into it, the more comfortable they get with it. It is, but if you can relax from the start, then yeah, it helps. Definitely helps. And it's funny, I've just it's be a yeah. massive step change. Like you'll see, often they'll come the first few weeks and they'll be a bit nervous and they'll be a bit stiff and rigid, and then there'll be a point where like the penny drops and they become mm. comfortable with it and it becomes mm. their own. And mm. it's when that happens that it. The step change is crazy. Yeah. yeah, it is. Do they do they record themselves? Like you know, practicing. Do they do they do that sometimes just to get into the flow? It's something that we recommend. Not everybody does it, of course. Yeah, okay. Um, but it is something that uh, we recommend that they do to listen back and if you realize how many times I used to say uh, uh especially uh. with people that do things like that that you don't you don't. It, they, you, you're not aware of it yourself until you listen to yourself back. So if somebody's talking ridiculously quickly, then the first thing that I'll suggest is that you have, just have a listen to yourself and hear how, what speed you're talking at so you can get a feel for it. Or if they say, uh, or, um, or what did someone say the other day? Essentially about 75 times, um, then it's good to do that. Do you record yourself, Dave? Well, I I live on Zoom, and so I, you know, not only do I record my calls, yeah, I also record all my interviews as well with customers. And it's interesting. There's a guy recently. And I got a transcript to save me time when I'm trans, uh, you know, writing on my notes. And there was a gentleman recently, and I interviewed him. He was a senior person as well. But he said, you know that much. When I actually looked at the content at the end of it, there was about seven words left. <laughs> But again, you know, it's interesting. People often say to me, what are other people working on, you know, yeah. recruiting tools to develop themselves? And I think, you know, there's probably some really good communication coaches out there. Yeah. And I don't think many people would actually think to ever engage somebody like that because, you know, people who com communicate really well through language and, and body as well, mm. it's, it could be a superpower. Yes, I agree. There's a guy that always pops up on my TikTok He's yeah. a young Asian guy, and he's like a communication coach. And basically, his videos are him delivering a message in one way, and then slightly changing the tone, and talking about how differently it lands. I'll find him. I'll share it. I'll share his his name in maybe the next. Podcast. Yeah, I'd like to see him. It'd be what interesting. That sounds really, really good. good. Really that reminds good. me of um, Eat Shoots and Leaves. Have you seen that book? No. It's just like, it's based, well, it's about grammar and how just changing the position of like one comma, comma can change the whole meaning of a sentence. And the example of the sentence is eat, shoots, eats, shoots and leaves. Ah, I, I might read that. I think I'd enjoy that. So obviously it can be interpreted in two completely different ways, depending on 
where you put the comma. <laughs> anyway, um, so what have I been helping people with? I know you haven't asked me that question, but I'm going to answer it. Right. I have been, um, I've just come off a call where I've been helping with three main things. The first was a client who is disappointed with what they found in the market through the search and they're in week three, uh, which is challenging. And uh, uh, our member was looking for help on how to help his client through the next stages of the search and guide on what direction to go in. It's all um, associated with transparency and showing the client what is in the market rather than what we have produced and there's a big difference. As a contingent recruiter, we tend clients tend to see us as can you can you get some CVs and can you send some CVs and we're just gonna pull these people out of fucking hats. And yet moving into being a search consultant, we execute the search to bring what is available to them in the market. So it, it's not our fault that they're not finding what they want to find. We're only we're only here to to bring that to light. Um, so that helps and we've worked out a, a journey of uh, for the next call for him to walk through the journey they're on they've been on and what their options are moving forward using evidence and data and then a LinkedIn uh, marketing challenge which was like inertia I know I need to do BD I've just finished a couple of searches I know I need to get out some stuff. I know who I am and who I serve, but where do I start? What's the first thing that I do and how can I just get going on that journey? Like if that were you, Dave, and someone came to you with that problem, well, how would you help or would you have any advice to help someone just do something that's going to get that the juices flowing and the ball rolling for I think it sounds pathetic, but just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and you can bring the whole to you. That's what she was saying, but she just didn't know which to do, what to do first, really. It was, I know I need to do some cold calls. I know who I need to call. I know I need to put some stuff on LinkedIn. And I know I need to send out some emails. And I want something working in the background for me whilst I'm hand approaching people. I'm just like paralyzed with all these things I need to do and not actually doing anything. So. I think, you know what, and this might sound branding 101, and this is what people talked about years ago, but I don't think many recruiters do it that well present day. You know, if you find out what other your clients are consuming in terms of content, and you just find good content, and you put your spin on it in a way that's going to make them think of you as a thought leader, or you position your brand around great content, it's really not that hard. I don't think yeah. everyone thinks they can, you know, create this fabulous content every single day. But you know, just go where your customers hang out, find a great article or video, put your spin on it, few words that makes you feel like you've got an opinion or you've got a thought or you want to get some conversations going, and do that. It's yeah. not really that hard. No, I love it. There's a really Luckily. good tool, by the way, called Passel to help you do that. Cool. Uh, there's a really good tool called Passel, P A W S L E, and it basically they sponsor allows... your podcast. They're not, no, they could be though. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, joking. Um, yeah, basically it basically allows you to pick up articles, pick up videos, and turn it into your own blog and put your commentary around. Yeah, two Yeah, I have a question to ask you guys. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the interviewer. Okay. Um, when you know a lot of the narrative out there is that contingent recruiters fill 20 to 30 percent of the roles that they are assigned yeah. but there are recruiters that work continually that actually do do 60 70 80 percent yeah. how often are those types of people actually coming to you and um wanting to get that up to maybe 90 percent and want to look at a retained solution well, yeah. quite you, you, you we tend I think I, they tend to fall into different categories one of the most common ones is 
that they're working on a contingent basis and delivering in a contingent fashion and don't want to be don't want to be doing that anymore because the fill rates are so low but quite often we come across and people come to us because they are actually delivering what is essentially a retained solution but on a contingent basis and not and being vulnerable and they're exposed of course because um i don't know that i've come across a contingent recruiter with a fill rate that high though 80 percent. i don't think i've ever come across not because they're not good at what they do but just because like clients change their minds and change the only things out of their control yeah i think i've got one that i know that's around that hovers around the 78 percent mark yeah 70 okay. mark. Seven, maybe 70 percent. yeah i think i've come across people I, I, interesting. I i've got a client at the moment sorry sorry that i was going to say the, the risk for those people right i found when i've had conversations with people like that in the past is they're super successful right if you're working contingently you've got an 80 percent fill rate you're earning good money now most people i find kind of live live to the means right so they have bills based on them having an 80 percent fill rate but they're totally vulnerable yeah. because overnight that can change right a changing market condition they've got a mortgage they've got nice cars the kids are in private school all based on this 80 percent fill rate but it's built on sand it can just fall mm -hmm. away overnight there's nothing to stop the client from just saying, yeah, we've got a pin on that. We're not we're not going to go ahead with that anymore. And there's just nothing there, is there? So, yeah, we do get people like that. Well, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I think, you know, looking at the interest rates going up and up and up in Australia and around the world, I think volatility is just going to be... I know everyone's really super positive and optimistic in recruitment landings. You know, 2024 is going to be the best year ever. Um, but I think there's going to be... A, it's going to be volatile for the next 12 18 maybe 24 months that's just my personal feelings maybe we yeah. should have a switch up in uh in, in normally we do wins of the week and then we yeah. go on out of a minute on mindset but that leads very nicely into the mindset yes. and the conversation lou's had so lou over to you it does, it does it does okay we'll do that do that now then so i had a conversation with one of our very uh, long-standing experience and esteemed members, I should say, who is in the private equity space in North America and has access to, how did I describe this guy this morning? Very senior, very clever, and yeah, yeah. really, yeah. very really well respected. Very well respected. This is our member, but also the guy he was talking to. So I don't know who it was he was talking to, but it was somebody in the private equity world, very, very, very senior and very, very, very well respected and very smart. And he said um, about market conditions and about the economy, it's fantastic. Finally, they've announced that we're in a recession, which they have in uh, North America and Canada, as you know. Thank fuck for that. It's brilliant. And then uh, our member said, oh, OK, thinking that this was going to be a, you know, me type conversation. There's uh, uh, opportunity and adversity and, you know, yeah. every cloud and all that shit, um, which I maintain my stance on, by the way. Um, but he didn't say that. He said the reason it's so fantastic is because we have to be in a recession officially for two clear quarters to be able to announce that we're in a recession. And when you look at the trend of recession after recession over the decades, once it's been announced, that's when the boom starts. So we've got another quarter, maybe, of people being getting their ducks in a row ready for it changing. And all of the private equity firms, certainly in North America and Canada, that's what they're doing. This quarter is preparing for what's about to happen. So 2024 is predicted to be excellent because they've announced we're in a recession. Uh, I love it. I'm going um, with that. It's going to come in January, new year, new start. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'm going to be quoting the private equity folks on my post from now on. Happy days. Yeah. yeah. So let's go with that. So um, now we're backwards. Um, let's go back to wins of the week. We're going to share some more positivity. 
I was telling you before, wasn't I, Lou, why you're bringing them up? I had a call with a lady yesterday um, who hopefully will be joining us very shortly. And she said, I've been listening to your podcast. I'm like, these are wins of the week. We can't just all be so positive. And I was like, no, no, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah I showed is. around, showed her all the wins on this, on our platform. It is. Um, so, yeah, this was hard. Does that work, by the way? I know I've put our faces on that screen. Does that... Can you see our faces now, or could you not see them before? I have no idea what you mean. Oh, oh, it's fine. I'll leave it there. I just want to make sure for the recording, like... Um, I can put, just see... I can see I've the got way. two screens now. I'm getting very confused. I never used to have two screens before. That's why I'm, like, looking over here. Anyway, go on, George. Take it away. Yeah, what is this we're looking at here? Did a, a first pitch to a new client today. You had no immediate need. This is half a win. But nevertheless, half, half a win. Is still a win. Um, no, how, uh, how is half a win? He did the diagnostic on a general level, did the pitch and used the iceberg slide. Our members will know what we're talking about there. After the objection of all recruiters telling me they are covering the market and engaging passive talent, he was absolutely bought into the whole process, didn't blink at the fees and has booked us in for a site visit in a couple of weeks to meet other stakeholders in the business and take us out for lunch. Very happy with the pitch. Oh my gosh. You- all so much for your help so far. Louise. I think I know who this is as well. Is this, is this, I won't say a last name, is this Tracy? It is. Yes. 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 She was so nervous about that pitch. She was so nervous about it. And she came and practiced like three times and it was so good. And I was like, oh, go and it. It's all. And do you know what? That just shows the different levels of relationships when you start engaging and asking deeper and more strategic questions. And that you think, you, you know, you think it might not go down well or whatever, but... Like what you're saying is 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 yeah. like even if they don't want to do it, it's good and it's helpful stuff. Like they're not going to be um you know unhappy with you or cross yeah. with you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm people are surprised. Shit about a PSL. Take me out for lunch. That's why. <laughs> yeah. No. So tell us about this one. Yeah, a win of sorts. Um. So this guy Brian is actually based in Australia. Um, he said he pitched to a big data banking solutions business in Australia and the outcome was not a brief yet, but they do want him to write them a market report for senior management, looking at salary, skills, experience and availability, some benchmark knowledge for them whilst they engage the market to make hires an understanding of the landscape. I say a win because they're going to pay me up front for this work. Lovely. I certainly feel that it represents a chance to be their go-to guy for multiple senior mm-hmm. hires in the future. The person they use has just left the industry. They are one of the fastest growing companies in their sector in Australia. Awesome. I think he's undersold the title of Win of Source. I think Win of Source is a bloody big win, yeah. And then he goes on to say, "Um, I want to make a good impression. Has anyone delivered such a document? Will you share your template? And of course, I might have done a few things like this before. So I sent um, in the chat all of the templates and several videos on explaining how to go about um, scoping it and carrying it out and delivering it so that they're wowed in the same way that um, I was referring to. Well, I didn't actually get around to talking about it, but we talked about the LinkedIn content that one of our members was struggling with. What she actually had was she's actually done one of these compensation benefit reports. And so what we started with was what about taking that and saying I've just done this I want to share the results with you who wants to hear about it um anyway so um that was one and what's this one George yeah this is Mark yeah hi guys short and sweet new client signed a retained search first one since completing the course been spending most of my time on BD since I'm feeling really good about the pipeline that's building nice well done Mark yeah he's doing really well um another one yeah, sharing a win. Just had news that I've won a retainer that I pitched for on Monday. I'm absolutely buzzing as I know I was up against some big firms. Still working on my pitch, but decided to just go for it in my meeting. <laughs> but I might as well try it out. So I'm super delighted that it's delivered the result I wanted. Nice. Now I think to nail it with Louise Archer on my pitch training call tomorrow. That's the one to be nervous for, the one with Louise. Yeah, yeah. yeah not bothered Been about there and done them, I know, I know. <laughs> Very good. Very, very good. And we like sharing that just to encourage people like, yeah, you might be feeling like things are a bit slower, but people are winning retained work still and we'll keep doing so and we'll keep sharing it with you. So um, 
we also like to talk about something that's kind of piqued our interest or is yeah yeah we do and actually normally we pick something that somebody else has been through or someone else has shared on LinkedIn uh, but actually I want to talk about a personal conversation this week that oh. I had a coaching call um, somebody was talking about a challenging situation they were facing with a client where HR slash talent, uh, yeah. HR slash talent um, had said they weren't allowed to speak to the hiring manager. And somebody made the comment, it might have even been me, that, oh, God, yeah, HR. Oh, it wasn't you, was it? I remember. Someone said, I don't know. Anyway, yeah normally go to the, the source of the pain, go to the hiring manager, right? Yeah. And then one of our members said, ah, well, interestingly, I was a HR director for many years and I have a totally different perspective on this. I know how it feels when you're kind of navigated around and you feel like you've been cut out of the process and how that can get you back up and it can make you feel out of control and I just thought it was a really interesting topic of conversation around how, you know, can we sell retain to HR and talent teams? Yeah. When you told it me the first time this morning, I think it was more like somebody had kind of started saying, yeah, we don't want to talk to HR. They're a fucking nightmare. They mm. always get involved in everything. And then someone on the call was like, uh, I'm a HR director or I spent 20 years being a HR director and I was thinking oh my god where's this gonna go um, but it sounds like it wasn't so fast. <laughs> no it, it was just it was a really in and the topic of conversation then went on for about 20 minutes yeah and I was born and raised in a contingent world right yeah. where I was told just avoid HR. <laughs> yeah 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 to the hiring manager they're the one with the control that makes the decisions hiring manager contact if we talk a lot about the grading system and contingent right yeah. that was one of the the contributing yeah. factors to was it an a grade job did you have direct manager contact um i'm still to a point i feel often the best way to engage is to start with the people with the sharp point of the pain right that the hiring manager sometimes that's hr though yeah yeah exactly exactly um what because I selling yeah. the to HR. Though? So well, I had I was exactly the same as you and been brought up in contingent and avoid HR like the plague and all the things that I suspected probably did come up and hopefully the HR person wasn't was understanding of that rather than um upset by it. And it sounds like they were very helpful in the end, so that was cool too. But I then moved to a firm who specifically only work with HR. And that those were our prospects. And that was what all of our branding, marketing, material, services, products, solutions, everything was geared to HR. And what I discovered was they experienced massive pain. They're just different. And um, we worked with the HR teams and the three main instances were, have I, have I shared this before oh, already? Sorry. You can never say things too many times can you well they say you've got to say something nine times to someone before it actually goes in and I often say that just so that they hear that again um that it's either the three c's it's either capacity and they just haven't got enough um manpower to deliver the kind of requirements that they they need to deliver or it's a capability it's a skill set or something niche that they could get up to speed with but haven't got the time or the resources to be able to get there that quickly and we happen to be experts and you can get to the understanding of the requirement more quickly and therefore finding the people more quickly or confidentiality where they just can't go to market themselves because it's a confidential position and they're all branded up with the company brand so they need a third party to do it and those are the three main instances that we um, positioned ourselves to partner with HR and it works fucking beautifully if you'll pardon my friend. Well, I think this is what we're talking about when we go about positioning. I think I worked with someone a few, about four or five years ago now who, I think her mum and dad were um, in HR. She was a senior consultant and she was a director in a business. And we helped position her brand all around HR and content, uh, content creation around talking to the needs, wants and desires of HR people. Nobody yeah. else was doing it. So she, no. she cleared up. Yeah, yeah. Nobody Absolutely else does cleared it. up. You set yourself apart straight away when you have good, productive, constructive, helpful, 
conversations with them rather than trying to bypass them and yeah. trying to usurp them. Like it's simple as that. Well, the other thing we need to think about here as well is that more and more organisations are bringing in chief people officers, which yeah. you know is a new evolution. Not it's not HR per se; it's employee experience, customer experience as well. And so, um, you know, they're 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 the nouveau HR people in my eyes. And so, you mm. know, could you position your brand to be talking to those people if you mm. if you work with those types of firms? Nice, good. I love it. Okay. Um... I think that's all we've got time for today. Hopefully, uh, whoever's listening, and there used to be like 12 of you. I think there's a bit more now. Oh, <laughs> six. I checked, I checked last night that you got six. Six, all right. <laughs> it's actually gone down. That's why, that's why we're rolling out the big dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they will get viewers up. Yeah, we need to actually bring some people to listen to us. So whoever is listening, thank you very much for listening. I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, Dave, how can people get hold of you if they're interested in engaging or finding more about your services? Just find me on LinkedIn. David Wollstone Home, Brand Me Better. David Wollstone Home, Brand Me Better. Find him on yeah. LinkedIn. You heard it here. Yeah. And yeah. we'll have, you know, a cut, Dave. Thank you very much. Only joking. Only Gee, joking. Gee. All right. Um, we will see you next for the next episode, whatever number that is, and whatever we're going to be talking about then. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thanks, Thank you, Dave. Look at like Jordan smiling. Right. There's a there's a reason why I'm in love with the guy. Look at him. Look at that smile. Me, Beautiful man. <laughs> Beautiful man. Bye, Good night, guys. Well, that's another episode of Retrain Search, the podcast in the bag. Thanks for listening to our wild tales, LinkedIn controversies, and our top tips on how to sell and deliver retained search. Get involved in our next episode. Send in your questions and share your experiences with us by emailing podcast at retrainedsearch.com. And don't be shy. Connect with us on LinkedIn and come and say hi. We don't bite, unless you're a Shrek firm, that is. We want to say a special thank you to our retrained members for sharing what's working for them right now and innovating new ways to grow and evolve. It's an incredible community. If you're wondering what exactly we mean when we mention our communities, well, we have two separate programs. Our Search Foundations program is for recruiters who want to learn how to sell and deliver retained search solutions consistently. And we have our Search Mastery Programme. That's for business leaders or owners already at 50% retained or more and looking to scale and grow and structure their search firm. We cap memberships to these programmes to protect the integrity of the community. If you want access, just talk to us. Okay, thanks for listening. We'll be back very soon with another episode of Retrain Search, the podcast. <laughs>